Today in the garage, we present part two of our two-part series with NXP semiconductors. Where we left off with our guest Brian Carlson was talking about how STV can be changed with a wide range of silicon and ecosystem solutions. In today's conversation, we'll continue and look into the future of vehicles such as zonal architectures, collaboration, and many other aspects. Let's go. We've seen also, you know, that you mentioned the, a lot of software engineers, not just hardware engineers. I mean, we're, we're dealing with that. We're meeting some of your incredible folks on a continuous basis to solve these problems. Yes. And um, we're, we're pleased to be a part of it. We're, we're pleased to be developing on top of uh, a, a range of your platforms and, and working with you in the future. So uh, it's a great collaboration. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you guys bring a lot of expertise in, you know, software defined networking and coming in from the infrastructure enterprise side, which I love about automotive is that we're working with different types of companies that aren't traditional automotive. We did another release this week on the security side of really bringing leadership security from the enterprise world. And now you know, working with you guys from the networking world, we have a lot of expertise in networking too from a hardware point of view. If you sure. go all the way back to Motorola sure. and the heritage, Motorola, Freescale, now NXP. Right. Uh, we've been in, that, in the digital networking area for many, many years. And having your software expertise on top of the silicon, it's a powerhouse, right? It's yeah. it's like best in class types of things, which is really valued by the OEMs because yeah. they need that. I mean, they, they're building their expertise too, but at the same time, what we're finding is collaboration with the OEMs and, and the tier ones, but a lot with the OEMs now, they want to collaborate going deep, yeah. right? We'll have OEMs come in for two weeks where we just deep dive and you know, we work together with, with Sonatus also yeah. to, to really say, here's how we can bring an end-to-end -end solution that's optimized. It's not just, right. here's a chip from NXP, right. here's some software you can put on with Sonatus. It's like, we actually work together to make these things streamline, work efficiently. Right. And I think that's the key is these types of partnerships to make it easy because this STV, as we talked about, is disruptive, it's a challenge. Right. And it requires that level of collaboration to make it all come together. That's right. I mean, you, you talked about networking. That's one area where you know, one of the we bring a skill set with a lot of mm -hmm. um, folks from uh, software defined networking world and data center networking world. So one of the things we do is provide uh, our customers with a configuration platform. We call it uh, our foundation platform mm -hmm. that allows customers to configure their vehicle networks, adjust them, manage them. Uh, and I think that's that's very powerful. And then you mentioned also some of our data products. Our collector product is is working today on top of NXP hardware, where we're doing fine grained data collection. So it's it's very exciting to be working side by side with you and help deliver that kind of a combination solution to our OEM customers and tier ones. Yeah, it's really important. And one thing I like to say about software defined vehicles, everyone talks about over the air updates. They talk about you know putting new apps. That's what I don't like about. It. It's not like just like the smartphone, but think about. When you put a new application down or a new service anywhere in the vehicle, now we're not just talking about putting it on a server, we're talking putting it at the lowest levels. That drives new types of data, new bandwidth, new characteristics. And think about how do you manage that? You can't just put something down. You have to configure the network. And with this whole new Ethernet, the time-sensitive networking, which is critical for the backbone of these right. vehicles, right? right? You need to have a way to manage quality of service, yeah. right? Determinism. If you just download something and you don't factor in traffic engineering, right. which is critical, this is this whole software-defined network. Right. I don't think people are talking enough about that. So we're trying to educate people about you know, that this is a critical area. It's not just software and being able to deploy into virtual machines and all this. But now what happens with getting you the data when you need it? Right. What happens with you getting critical information right. and moving that across the vehicle if you don't do the proper traffic engineering or to have the dynamic way to reconfigure, to manage the network, you're in trouble. Yeah. And that's what I like about what you guys are doing, right? You're offering that capability and you're enabling the OEM customers to be able to do that. Yeah. And that helps tremendously because a lot of those lessons have been learned, yeah. right? Coming yeah, from you don't need you to guys. reinvent the wheel. Exactly. You know, I think this is a perfect segue actually maybe to talk about Zonal. You mentioned mm -hmm. Zonal earlier. One sure. of the areas we've been collaborating extensively with you is on uh, enabling and, and plowing the field, if you will, for next generation Zonal networks. Mm -hmm. We have this fantastic demonstration we did last uh, this past Consumer Electronics yes, Show. Yes, yes. Uh, and and we, we speak about it frequently. We had a webinar with NXP a couple of months back mm -hmm. talking about Zonal, which we can put a link to in the, in the uh, oh, show great. description. Yeah. But one of the things that you, you talked about uh, vehicle network in real time, I think of Zonal as almost um, 
kind of the, you, you talked about real time in terms of the processing, but right. the zonal network and using these next generation zonal is how do we bring that quality of service? How do we bring that real time over to modern networks? Yeah. Because cars have been historically based exclusively on or largely on CAN networks or mm -hmm. other technologies. Yep. As we shift to automotive ethernet and other kind of newer technologies that are more configurable, you have to then realize that all traffic's not created equal. Exactly. You know, I need to make sure my time-sensitive traffic gets there when it needs to, mm -hmm. and I have maybe uh, non-time-sensitive traffic that maybe video or other things that might be sharing the same links. How do we manage that? And it's about quality of service, but it's not static. Mm -hmm. It needs to be adjusted as new traffic sources come to make sure you're you're delivering on time. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why this collaboration like I talk about is being really critical. But what we're, what we're doing in our silicon, especially in the in the zones, is actually putting hardware in there to right. be able to help enable that. Right. Right. And actually putting within like the S32Z and E, right? They have a built-in Ethernet switch with lots of configurability options. They have internal ports where I can actually map an Ethernet port to any software task. Right. And so you can dynamically configure and control that, leveraging also Ethernet uh, time sensitive networking right. and the ability to do things in a chip. You know, one of the key things is how do OEMs and tier ones move from today's model of boxes? Right. To this concept of virtual ECU, they need a they need a glide path. They need a glide path. That's right. a great exactly. Yeah, they need a way to do that. That's one thing that's really important that we've been focusing on too with our with our devices with our software. So, example, Goal, uh, Green VIP is a, a software that lays on top of it, but we lay the foundation first with the silicon by being able to virtualize everything, literally isolate everything right. in hardware right. from the core to the memory, to the peripherals, and to the IO pin. That's what's really unique. Right. You know, we do the whole thing. It's not just part of it. We do the end-to-end. -end. Right. So think about what we can do. We can actually, through that hardware isolation, which you can bring up, at, at, you can configure dynamically mm -hmm. or lock it at boot time securely, right? And you can do that. So you are able to make that processor or that task look like the old days right. or the current days right, right now. Right, right, where it's a box. Right. So it has guaranteed quality of service. It has guaranteed bandwidth to, me to the memories. Right. It has guaranteed, I only control these IOs and these yeah. timers and all that. So you have that freedom from interference. Right. So it starts with that silicon to be able to do that. And right. then that layer of software, like the green VIP that sits on top, allows people to t really take control of all those knobs and switches and, and be able to configure that whole chip like they need to. Right. And one thing I like to talk about is like, I could put that chip in the cloud in a box and you could have multiple tier ones actually developing software on the same chip, even the same core, the same ARM core. Mm -hmm. And they don't even know about the other tier ones. Right. And what's really important, people don't talk about this a lot, is that there's IP concerns. Yeah. So now we're in a you know an integration world with multiple providers of software. Right. You don't want you know tier tier one A and a tier one B to have access to their the competition's code. Right. So now this also enforces uh, privacy and security and all this also because they're totally isolated. Yeah. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the consolidation, but now you still maintain the development environment, right. like the individual boxes and the privacy and the isolation, which is really critical right. to OEMs. If you right. don't have this type of technology, right. it's not going to work in SDV. So the hardware builds that, the, goal via, the green VIP configures it, and then we work with uh, partners like Sonatus, right, to really layer their software and control on top of all that right. from the cloud all the way down into the zones. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that we talked about this glide path and, yeah. and some of these hardware. You know, CAN's not going away. Oh, no, it's we, still there. It's yeah. very much still gonna be there for a while. But at the same time, you also want to use the kind of the, the main backbone of the vehicle to shift to automotive ethernet mm -hmm. or future standards, and there's a lot of evolution of those standards mm -hmm. happening right now. So we do a lot of work in, in conjunction with you on things like uh, CAN to Ethernet and using these modern, some of the new TSN networking standards from, uh, from the IEEE that allow you to take a CAN signal, convert it to an Ethernet signal and send it to the other side and convert it back to a CAN signal, yes. which allows you to not have to re-engineer everything in one go you can have a, a transition path. And at the same time, what there's also things like redundancy and so on in some of those standards that are really powerful. Yeah, definitely. I'm glad you brought that up. That's really important because SDV is, is a journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Right. Right. And think about all the legacy that OEMs have. And they actually have boxes right now that they don't 
always know exactly what goes on because people designed them 10, 15 years ago and those people are gone and they may not be as documented as well as they could. They need to move that over. We're actually working to help assist OEMs to move stuff onto platforms like this, but they're still going to rely in some cases also on legacy boxes. Right. So SDV does not, and Zonal doesn't magically come in and replace everything. Now, there's some clean slate people, right? right? Silicon Valley, China, right? Where there's a little bit different scenario, but the large OEMs have a lot of legacy that they want to le still leverage in places. Yeah. And it's, it's it's more of a marathon. So you need that ability to support some of these that hang off the zone. These are like those end nodes yeah. for these legacy ECUs. And they still were, use CAN. Yeah. Or they'll start to leverage CAN XL. We start to support CAN XL now, mm -hmm. right? To, to give higher speed bandwidth and such. So you need to be able to support the legacy, the legacy interfaces. They they don't go away. So the CAN will be around for a long time. But the backbone really to connect all this is going to be more the the TSN Ethernet. Yeah. And the redundancy does come in. That's part of it. So like I was talking about quality service, determinism, guaranteed bandwidth. Yeah. But having that redundancy, because what happens if a line breaks, you still need to maintain the right. vehicle. Right. And you mentioned earlier of the zone. One yeah. of the key things is weight uh, in terms of the, the vehicle weight, the cabling complexity, mm -hmm. the assembly complexity of yeah. traditional vehicles is a, is a huge impediment to production. So I think that's something that it's going to be improved with that way. Yeah. Um, I have it, an example real quick on that one. Sure. And it's because people don't think about this sometimes, but sometimes, you know, we talk about zonal, we talk about the shift and I think that's going to be incremental sometimes. If you look at every OEM is doing a little bit different approach and some are evolutionary will it go from one approach and then maybe another right. approach a few years later. Right. So this is not going to just happen in 24 or 25 necessarily. There'll be different steps. But one thing that's interesting is one of the incremental steps is what we call body zonal. Mm -hmm. And you made me think about this because manufacturing is a huge issue today, right. right? Where they have these large cables. And we've heard stories where they actually have to heat the cables to actually get them in the door. Right. So think about, we want to eliminate a lot of wiring complexity because the reliability and manufacturing is a huge issue. If I can decrease the time manufacturing, that's more margin for my right. right vehicle, or I can reduce my cost. Right. For the OEM. For the OEM. Yeah. This is huge. But now we're seeing what's called body zonal, right? There may be this incremental step. Well, let's kind of ease into zonal, but let's do the body because that gives us a big bang for the buck. Right. And it's fairly easy rel relative to doing all the real time and all the other stuff right. that has to happen. It's localized. It's localized. Yeah. So think about it. I have those four zones and I have one box. I'm running one cable, not 100, cable, 100 wires into a box, right. right? It makes it easy to manufacture. It sets me up for the future. You start to do that integration into these devices. You start to integrate and understand isolation and how you develop in a new SDV world. And at the same time, you're eliminating weight, right? Right. All that weight of all those cables and copper complexity of reliability sure. and goes up and all this stuff. So I just want to make that point because you brought that up, yeah. that that is a key aspect right now. And one of the steps in some cases for OEMs to move towards zonal focus initially just on the body part because it provides all that right. value. So, right. And yeah. I think more if you pull back more broadly and you mentioned kind of some of the there's companies that are more aggressive in going through a completely clean slate approach mm -hmm. and others that are on a legacy path and everywhere in between. And one of the things that we've been doing and it sounds like you're doing as well is is showing our OEMs and tier one customers that you don't have to throw away everything you're doing. No. If you want to start with a clean slate, that's great. We can help with that. Mm -hmm. But if you have an existing infrastructure, existing um, foundation capabilities and so on, we can help you get to that yeah. future place at the pace you're ready to, to do. That's exactly right. Now, I had conversations with OEMs and tier ones actually this week here. Uh, there's several of them that came into our show. And um, we had those types of discussions because they're all trying to determine what is the right path? What is the, min the least you know, managing their risk, basically, right? How do we get those value propositions that we started talking about? Yeah. How do I do that? Even if it's incrementally, what, where do I get the most bang for the buck and how do I do this over time? Because they, they all have constraints. Everyone's going through, they have to you know, hire new types of talent. They have to start, you know, do more cross-organizational and people have to think at a system level, not at a box or a subsystem level. So yeah. that's, that's huge, but they have to start thinking, what can I do in the interim as I'm transforming my organization? What can I do to get there? So these conversations, whether it's through you, through the software, the configuration, the automation, us for the silicon, right? And the key thing there for silicon is scalability. So scalability to have compatible devices that are the same device, but have scalability and performance footprint compatible, software compatible, but take you also into the future. Right, whether it's within that same family or uh, an evolution into the future, like what we're doing with five nanometer devices, you know, we're already looking. We have devices coming that are five nanometer that just take this to the next yeah, level. You, you mentioned there's a new part coming. Do you uh, want to tease yeah. us a little bit about that? Yeah, but yeah, people keep asking. Right, we showed uh, our chip last 
uh, at Capitex, our first test chip, five nanometer test chip. So we actually have a functional test chip today. We have a five nanometer device, the first one, in fact, the first five nanometer device, I believe in NXP, it's called the S32N. And S32N is gonna play a key part in these SDVs. So we're not really giving much more than that other than it's coming and that there's a nice, I would say, roadmap from our current silicon to the next generation. And so look in the near future for some exciting announcements there. And the cool thing about it, we haven't really talked about that, is you know, how does the software development process change? How does the cloud come in? Because this really, I would say, is the trigger point where things are now all developed in the cloud, pretty right. much, right? Because before the silicon avail, the production uh, intent silicon is coming soon. And how do I develop ahead of time? Right. right, and so we talk about the industry talks about shift left, right? To, to shift my software development a year or more, and we're living that. Right, we're living that with S thirty two N because people are thousands of engineers are actually developing software today, and they've been developing it for quite a while right. in the cloud on the virtual S thirty two N. That's exactly right. We talked extensively with Stefano Marzani from AWS mm -hmm. about the importance of prototyping in the cloud. It was in one of our recent episodes. Yeah where he talked about the ability to, as you said, develop software before the hardware is even there and, yeah. and have engineers have you know much more scalable ability to develop than if you are tethered to real hardware. So it's a really important benefit. And it's, and it's great to hear you're doing that same way for in-house as well for your own development and yeah. prototyping. It's incredibly important because it's not only the shift left, it's the the um, you know taking this into the future. Right. It's the whole continual development. Like I said, the car improves yeah. over time. So we actually, uh, you know, support um, you know, not, not just shift left, but extend it to the yeah. right, right? Yeah. So it goes through the whole life cycle. So the infrastructure you put in, you know, starts with the SOC. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the box, you know, the, the zone or control and, and bring those together. Yeah. So, you know, you'll see complete vehicles being virtualized and digital twinning becomes huge. That's great. Right. And uh, it's, it's about using the cloud to basically do the whole development cycle, not just for development, right. but for the whole life cycle of the car. This, this whole aspect of yeah. prototyping, I, we could spend an hour just oh, talking about that. It's a huge topic. So we right won't now. try today, yeah. but maybe we'll have another episode. Maybe we'll get Stefano here <laughs> to join good. us How and we can works. have a three-way conversation about that <laughs> because I know you've done a lot of work, you mentioned with AWS, but yeah. especially on this prototyping aspect, you've really been leading the way. Yeah. So look, we've had a long conversation and we've touched on so many areas. Yeah. Maybe let's just, any final sure. thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I think we, we hit all the key points. So at a, at a high level, really, this is about disruption, but yeah. it's disruption for good, about setting the platform for the future that's gonna really enable a lot of new use cases, opportunities, yeah. revenue generation for not just the OEMs, but yeah. I think for the ecosystem. But the thing is, it requires that collaboration. Yeah. It requires hardware, silicon, that is really optimized to do this. Because if you don't have that yeah. silicon base, Right, people talk about abstracting software and hardware, almost like hardware doesn't matter. We can just plug in a, a board from here or there. Right. It's not as simple as it's made yeah, out It's a to partnership. Be. It's gotta be both It sides. has to be, and that's the key point, is that the hardware has to be really, really good. And so I look as an innovation sandwich, like these different layers, like you know, we're at the foundation, we're that bun on the bottom that's the innov bringing innovation yeah. of how I do this efficiently, safely, securely. And you gotta think about this, this is not, a data center or a smartphone or the devices that people worked on before. It's more like an airplane, right? right. Your life's depend right. on it. Right. So we can't forget safety yeah. is huge. And that has to be, you know, this is a big concern. A lot of people talk about, yeah, software-defined vehicles, but I have to have safety. You can't do both. Of course. Well, there are ways, and it does require a lot of hardware and yeah. software that supports it and layering it and actually making it safe. That's right. That's not an easy thing. So it's about the collaboration based hardware that's designed for SDVs, yeah. that does the security, that does the safety throughout the vehicle, right. not just certain boxes, but right. the whole vehicle. Uh, it's the software enablement and the partnerships, the ecosystem, like working with Sonatus, to bring those capabilities and expertise from these other markets and other you know, worlds here, and then bring it all together and working very collaboratively right. with the OEMs and the tier ones to be able to bring yeah. the end-to-end -end solution. So I would say a takeaway is it requires the whole industry to work yeah. together, not just one player can do it all. Yeah, right? and that's what I took from today's conversation is mm -hmm. two key points. One is that there's this, it's a continuum. It's not, there's not that's one chip. Yeah. You don't replace with a central computer, put a, ser put a server in the trunk and that's it. Yeah. That's not going to solve the problem. You need a heterogeneous solution that serves different needs you have at real time. Yes. The second thing you mentioned, I think is really compelling is this journey to SDV really is a journey. It says a marathon, not a sprint as the saying goes. Yeah. But I think that's a pretty apt analogy where, you know, there are going to be uh, transitions and each OEM will transition at different speeds, mm -hmm. uh, different parts of the car shoot, uh, solving different problems. And, you know, I think it requires partnership, hardware and software working together 
to help um, each OEM, each tier one get to that point at the way that they're they're ready to do. So we're we're so excited to be partnering with Definitely. you, All right. and uh, and to, excited to be rolling down the the road in, in production vehicles. Yeah, I love with seeing the you. vehicles and say, "Hey, NXP and Sonata inside, I, right?" Me, me too. <laughs> I, I have a smile every time I see one. Yeah. So hey, look, thank you so much for Brian for joining us in the garage. We're really pleased to have had you here. I, I'm glad I had the opportunity. I've been watching this, these episodes. I said, oh, "I would love to be able to," because I love talking with you. And STV is such a great topic because, like I said, there's so many angles. Okay. So like I said, you, it's a gold mine, and you have a gold mine of episodes ahead, I'm sure, of just bringing to light all of that to your audience. So thank, thank yeah, you thanks so, for the opportunity. Thank I love you it. so much. We, we appreciate you bringing a different perspective on sure. today's, today's episode. Thank you, John. So thank you so much, Brian. Today's we talked all about software-defined vehicles from a new perspective, from the hardware perspective, and looking at how silicon and how silicon plus ecosystem partners can really make the difference for software-defined vehicles. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you like what you're seeing from the garage, please like the episode and even better subscribe so you can see our next upcoming episodes. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again in the garage very soon.